Uh, starting broadcast in three, two, one. Perfect. Sharing screen. Let's go ahead and so what I'm going to go ahead and do here is I'm just going to put in College of Marin tutoring into my search bar here. And it's going to pull up a few results here to start. Uh, as you can see, kind of in the upper left part, it says add. So don't, don't uh, check those out. You're going to come down here to this one at the top, or uh, I guess here, Tutoring and Learning Center. That's our main page, marin.edu. That's how you know it's us. This is our main um, tutoring page or uh, yeah, our tutoring center page. Got a bunch of different information about us, but you're gonna go over here to the left where it says tutoring schedule. You're gonna click that. That's gonna bring us to this page. And this page has, uh, as you might uh, guess, our, the schedule of all the different tutors. If I zoom in here, it says this is fall 2020 tutoring schedules. You have subjects here on the left and the tutors here on the right. And as you see in between, there's days and times when they're available. Uh, as you can kind of see, there's some slots that are filled, some that aren't. That's just because we're right now figuring out the schedules. Um, and those schedules are figured out according to your guys' needs, as some of you may know. Uh, and how we find out when you guys need our tutoring is through this link right here, tutoring request application link. So again, we just uh, navigated from the College of Marin tutoring page and went to scheduling. And now we're here at this page. I'm going to go ahead and click that link. And this is our final step in this journey. This is going to bring us to our um, tutoring uh, uh, page. Now, when you go to this, you have to log in. Um, to your MyCom ID. But once you do that, it'll take you right to the form and you fill it out uh, for the tutoring times that you think you might need. We'll just take a quick look at this form. Okay, perfect. So when you log in with your tutoring or with your uh, COM ID, it just auto fills your, uh, this information here. Um, and then you put in your email, your contact number, uh, where your classes are, EOPS. Many of you already know what that is, but if you don't, um, it's simply um, if you have some kind of learning disability um, or you need extra accommodations for tests or papers, there's the EOPS center, which you can go to and they'll help give you accommodations. I actually use it myself because I have a bit of something like ADD or what have you. So I get a little extra time on tests and such. So you make sure to do my best on those. So um, if you are a part of it, click yes. If not, just no. And then um, down here, it'll put up all of the classes you're enrolled in and you just select which one you're looking for for tutoring. You can do multiple. Um, request type face-to-face -face, online. You're just going to do online because that's what we're doing right now. And then last but not least, the most important part, the availability. So um, for availability, um, let's say I'm taking bio 224. And I say, man, I really need tutoring. Uh, the best day for me, best times would be Wednesday 9 to 10 and 10 to 11. Um, if you put that in, you are not committing to be there at that time, right? So um, it's no commitment for you we just need to know when might be good times for you uh, to, to uh, have tutoring, and then we can schedule our needs accordingly, uh, and we will uh, we'll try to be available during that time for you. Okay. It's drop-in tutoring, like I said, so no commitment. Um, just uh, we want those time slots to work the best for you. So, and then you can add any extra comments you need down there. So and that's the tutoring form. I'm gonna hop out of here. Um, unless anyone has any questions about this form while I'm here. If not, we'll just move on. But Okay. Um, I believe I just stopped screen sharing. Turn my video back on. So um, that said, um, a couple or I guess just one myth I wanted to dispel about the tutoring center. A lot of folks think that the tutoring center um, is for when you're doing terribly and you're just trying to make a last ditch effort for your class and you're like, well, 
I guess I should go get tutoring because that's what people that are failing get. Um, well, you know, it couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, tutoring really is where the A students hang out, honestly. Um, it's uh, just a great place to kind of reinforce your knowledge. Um, you don't have to come with specific questions. You can always just drop into the session and hang out, do your homework. Questions come up, you can ask us. Um, it's a pretty cool deal, even though we're, you know, at a distance here, it can work pretty well. So um, that is more or less all I have for you guys. Um, if you have any questions for me right now, I might be able to answer some quick ones. But um, if not, then um, if questions come up, you can definitely uh, go to that tutoring page. And there's our coordinator, Oksana is her name you can contact her through her email with any questions you guys might have. Um, so, yeah. Um, all right, well, awesome guys. Thank you so much. If you don't have any other questions or if you don't have any questions for me, then um, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate you giving me your ear and uh, Chris, look forward to seeing you guys soon. Chris. Yeah. When, when do you think the um, schedule will be ready um, for them to see? Yeah, thanks. It's a, it's a great question. Great question. So um, our tutoring coordinator, Oksana, she's the one who puts the schedules together. And she um, she's really doing her best to get them out as soon as possible. It's probably, we'll probably have the semester's solid schedules out um, in a week, two weeks max. Um, but that said, we are making some sessions right now just to just the, so there's something that students can come into um so uh, like i said my name is chris day so if you look on the schedule and you see i'm on the schedule for other subjects and there's no bio 224 quite yet um you are more than welcome to drop in on those sessions if there's other students for that subject i'll have to give them priority but more often than not there's often an open session you can just drop in and ask questions um, for physiology. So, um, so yeah, that, that's a good question though, Dr. E. I, yeah, uh, a week, hopefully two weeks max. So. And then also just remind everybody that the amount of hours they schedule for physiology is going to depend on the demand. So if you really want to have this available to you, you need to go, even though, I mean, it used to be so much easier. We just, hand out pieces of paper and you'd fill something out. Watching Chris describe this, I'm like, oh my God, this more <laughs> going into the computer and filling out stuff. But it's, it's gonna really serve you if you actually let them know that there is a demand and then they'll actually allocate resources to our class. So yeah. it is important yeah. to let them know that you want that if you do. Otherwise, you know, they'll allocate their tutoring hours to other classes that are asking for it. Yeah, yeah, it's true. It's true. And we have two other awesome tutors for physiology, um, as well as myself. So uh, there's lots of resources open for you guys. It's just like Dr. You said, you just got to um, take hold of it right now and, and make sure you secure it there. So yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. Awesome. So well, thank you so much, Dr. And thanks, guys. We'll see you soon. All right. I love Bye. All right. So so that really is a important resource. And again, like Chris was saying, not just, in fact, if you are starting, you know, if, if you're just wanting to stay on top of things or there's something that comes up that you have questions about, you know, obviously there's always office hours and I can help you with things. And it's often good to have another viewpoint or somebody who's not me to, maybe it's more relaxing for you. I don't know. But having, having different people to explain the same thing can often be a really helpful thing. Um, and he was also talking about EOPS. I'd also mention SAS. If there's any particular kind of accommodations or anything that you think are, that you need, you know, you need to go through the official channels if you are gonna get accommodations. So um, if you have questions about that, you can ask me in office hours later. Um, but just make sure that you follow up on those resources as well if you think those are going to be helpful for you succeeding in the course. All right. Um, 
So uh, I guess we will start by just looking at this little warm up that we did, kind of reviewing a little bit about the chemistry we covered last time. I'm going to go and get my, share my screen here. There we go, share screen. All right, and we can go to modules. Oh my God, warm up. And we can take a look here. All right, so, so this is good. You can, you know, actually, and this is actually, it's useful for you all to see, to get a sense of where you are with things. Like you can see here, if you are, down here, if you were like the 40 or 60%, you know, at this point, it doesn't really hurt you at all in terms of your grade. This is worth like, you know, less than a point, but it is a kind of indicator that, oh, I should be keeping up better, or I'm, I'm having trouble with these concepts. And if I just keep thinking, oh, it's gonna get better, you know, you probably, it probably won't, you'll probably, not do so well. So if you are consistently not doing well on these warmups, you need to figure out how to change your approach to the class. You know, that's something again, office hours, we can also talk about, you know, how you are studying or I can look at your notes or try to figure out, you know, because sometimes people are not used to a class that is as intense as this. And it, you know, sometimes people are coming out of a experience where yeah you just kind of keep coming to class and then cram right before the exam and it's all good you know this is a class where if you do that you'll probably fail so kind of keeping up along the way because each thing keeps building and there's way too much to cram at that last moment you nearly need to keep up as we go um so we can start with ph and again, like I said, this gets confusing because something goes up, some things go down, and it's always important to double check, making sure you're always remembering what is pH and what are the relationships between the different things. So if concentration of hydrogen ions increases, what's going to happen to the pH? We'll go it down. goes down. It's going to go down. And what does that mean in terms of the acidity? What's the acidity doing? Acidity the acidity is going up. It's becoming more acidic, more hydrogen ions, lower pH. So again, you want to keep that, keep those things straight. I promise you on your first exam, there'll be some question that's making sure that you can keep all that straight. So, you know, you're, you're forewarned that, you know, you need to be able to keep that all straight. You know, and again, pH is, as far as we're looking at it, a measure basically of hydrogen ion concentration in the solution. And there are some different ways to, to frame pH, but for our case, for our purposes, that's how we're going to be looking at it. Um, Right, and then, you know, we see 75% of the people had it, but 25, a quarter of the people had the opposite. And again, that's not, that's not that surprising because it's easy to get all mixed up in here. But over the next few weeks, I, if you're one of those 25%, you want to start really getting these concepts. And again, if, they're, if you're having trouble with them, again, there's office hours. There are the tutoring with Chris and the other tutors. Um, so just kind of putting that out there. Um, negative feedback loops. So this one, again, negative feedback loops are the most common way of maintaining homeostasis in your body. And so it's important to kind of have this basic idea, this basic idea, there's some variable, it changes, and the response is negative. It opposes the change. It makes the change go in the opposite direction. So in this case, 
you know, your body temperature is falling, you know, the response is your body does something to bring the temperature back up. Like shivering is operating the muscles, which releases heat in your body. You know, these other ones, you know, stomach starts secreting acid to prepare for a meal that you were about to eat. That's actually what we call like feed forward. That's like kind of anticipating a change. Um, your pituitary gland releases this, you know, adrenocorticotropic hormone, which causes adrenal gland to secrete cortisol. This is not actually even respond. We're going to see this later as a smaller part of a bigger loop, but this is not like a variable change. Is there a response to, you know, decrease that change? Um, this one here, this is actually with the platelets. It's actually a um, positive feedback loop. You know, the platelets send a signal that bring even more platelets. So you're increasing the, the change that's happening rather than opposing, minimizing the change. It's only this last example where the body temperature is falling. So there's a, something that moves it back in the opposite direction, starts bringing it back up. So, so that's that. Do, 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 do. Non-pull, this is something we talked about last class. We're gonna look at it in much more detail in lab today. Non-polar molecules and do not dissolve in water. Again, here we still, we had, we had like a quarter of the people saying sometimes, you know, non-polar, water is this quintessential polar solvent, which means polar things are gonna dissolve in it. We talked about that like dissolves like. So nonpolar, which includes like the lipids, the fats, uh, the steroid hormones. Um, it's going to be really important to know that they do not dissolve in water. You know, if we want to actually carry them around in the bloodstream, we're going to have to have special accommodations for them so they can actually get into the flow because in general, you know, I showed you when we pour the olive oil into the glass of water, it just separates and floats on top. So nonpolar, um, if it's a polar molecule, then it does dissolve in water as the corollary there. Separate individual water molecules are attracted to one another by and here we see most people got this hydrogen bonds. Those are those, again, those local charge imbalances that cause things to be attracted by their electrical, electrical charge. So hydrogen bonds are different from like the ionic and covalent bonds in that they are not kind of the intrinsic things attaching atoms to make a molecule. These are things here that are helping two molecules just stay attracted to each other. Or sometimes we're gonna actually see with proteins pretty soon, sometimes two different parts of a large molecule can end up being attracted to themselves. Um, but it's not like the sharing of electrons that you get in covalent bonds or in ionic bonds where you have this intimate relationship between atoms that creates a molecule. This is here, two different molecules that just happen to be attracted to each other. And finally, sodium chloride, AKA table salt, AKA also known as NaCl. You know, it dissolves in water. I mean, anybody who's tried to dissolve salt in water should, should be intuitive. Um, but this, and here we see 92% of the people got this. The chlorine and sodium atoms become independent ions. This is important. This is gonna be really important a little later today when we're talking about molarity versus osmolarity. When you put sodium chloride into water, each sodium becomes its own Na plus floating around making hydrogen bonds in the solution. Each chlorine becomes a Cl minus floating around making hydrogen bonds in the solution. Again, this is really different than dissolving sugar. If you dissolve a sugar in water, you know, C6H12O6, that sugar does dissolve, 
but those atoms that make up the sugar molecule all stay intact as an individual complete sugar molecule that just floats around as a sugar molecule. It doesn't dissociate, it doesn't come apart. So if you put one sugar molecule into water, you keep one particle floating around in the water. If you put an NaCl into the water, you're gonna end up with two separate independent things now floating around in the water. So you definitely wanna keep that idea in mind. It's gonna, it's gonna be really important as we talk about osmolarity versus molarity later on today. Um, are there any questions about any of these? Okay, because yeah, all of these ideas are gonna be kind of critical as we continue on in the semester. Um, Chief Professor, I have a question. Sure. Just to clarify, it's been a minute since chemistry. Um, with the hydrogen bonding, because you just said, I think in the last one, that the, when the Na and <clears throat> the Cl dissociate completely and then will form hydrogen bonds, is that what you said? I thought that only, there was only select molecules or atoms that could form hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen like, bond is just when there's a charge imbalance, so things attract without this actually intimate sh sharing of electrons. Okay. I would, I would call them hydrogen bonds because the water has a more positive or more negative side that's going to want to be attracted to the ion, which is also charged. Okay. So, you know, and, you know, maybe there actually is, maybe it's not official. I'm pretty sure it would officially still be a hydrogen bond. But maybe. I just thought that it was um, only oxygen, nitrogen, and fluorine with hydrogen that were, that were classified as hydrogen bonding, and then the other ones would be covalent bonding. No, no. So, so covalent bonding is a totally different. You know, well, sharing electrons. Hydrogen can make a right. If I right, if I'm thinking about water, these hydrogens are making covalent bonds with the oxygen to make the water molecule. But then, if we look between two separate water molecules, where this is kind of the more positive side, this is the more negative side, and due to those little lone pair electrons, you're gonna have hydrogens making a hydrogen bond, in this case, to attract this water molecule to this water molecule, but the hydrogen bonds are making a covalent bond with the oxygen to actually make the um, water molecule itself, right? So it depends on the context and what, what interaction you're looking at. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and again, and actually in our lab today, it's gonna ask you to draw hydrogen bonds or attractions between water molecules and glucose molecules. And typically when you are drawing hydrogen bonds, you use little dotted lines, dot, you know, to kind of imply that it's not this actual kind of intimate, it's not a covalent bond where you're actually sharing electrons, that it's just this kind of attraction between the positive and negative, like to be the, you know, kind of pulled together. Um, so, okay. So let's continue on with our chemistry review. We still got quite a few things we have to talk about with the basic chemistry before we can really start digging into, you know, physiology. Um, so we can start with atoms. Um, you know, if you get into the deeper parts of chemistry, you're gonna get into all sorts of things about atoms. For our class, all you need to know are the three basic subatomic particles, the electrons, you know, which have a negative charge. There's protons, which have a positive charge. Neutrons, which are neutral. What? That looks like negative, neutral. Um, there's my little eraser, there's my eraser. Um, neutrons. Um, 
you know, we kind of jumped the jumped the gun a little bit with bonds between atoms without actually introducing the atom. So let's introduce the atom. Again, we've got the nucleus, which has protons and neutrons in here. And then around the outside, we have the electrons. You know, and again, you know, in reality, if you get into the deeper math of it, it's just like you have to calculate the probability density cloud of where the electron might be found and things like that. We don't worry about that for our class. We just kind of think about the balance between electrons and protein, protons, and does this thing have a charge or not at the moment? So. How, if I have an atom here, and I've just kind of got my nucleus with the protons and neutrons, I've got electrons zipping around in this little cloud, and it's or their orbitals. How do I know what actual element I'm looking at here? Number of protons. Number of protons. Yeah, so that is important. So the atomic number, which is the number of protons, this is going to determine the element. Right, so if I have, um, I have only one proton in there, what element is it? Hydrogen. A hydrogen. Um, one of the things we're going to see, if we have a, a 11 protons, what's it going to be? It's going to be the noble gases? Glory, glory. What's that? So here, let me, I'm going to go, I'm going to share another screen with you. Hold on one sec. There we go. Yeah, let me get a better one. Here we go. 11 is nitrogen. Uh, no. It's sodium. It's, it's sodium. I'm, I'm having, I'm taking longer than I meant to, to share my screen here, but I finally got it. Okay, here we go. Here is a periodic table of the element. And uh, wait, come on. Sorry about this. What, for whatever reason, my screen is making me making it hard for there. Yeah, okay, now I, I'm trying to zoom this. We up. have a periodic table in the back of our book too. Yeah. So, cover. Okay, so it's yeah, so it's in your book and just to, it's worth looking at this periodic table and if you don't remember it as well, it's worth kind of getting to know it. So here if we look at sodium, I'm going to zoom in more and more and more. There we go. Sodium 11. So this number here is just telling you how many protons is in is in the nucleus. And so as long as there's 11 protons in the nucleus, you are looking at a sodium, no matter what else. Um, you know, over on this side, if you're looking at a chlorine, the chlorine is going to have 17 electrons, no not seven, 17 protons, no matter what other else is going on. If it has 17 protons, it's a chlorine. So that's kind of important. It's important to remember that number of protons defines what element it is. Um, other things we should remember from the periodic table, we're gonna come back here in a little while, but this atomic mass is gonna be important. And we're gonna actually convert between kind of the real world of measuring things out in grams and thinking about the idea of moles. 
So we'll use the periodic table to think about, you know, how many protons make up a particular element, but also we're going to use the periodic table to um, think about the atomic atomic mass. Um, also, I should just mention the letters. You know, sodium is Na, which is I think Latin for natrium. Natrium. You know, we're going to be talking about sodium all the time in our class. And you need to make sure that if you see the letters Na, you just instantly think in your head, oh, right, that's sodium. Um, another one we're going to use all the time is potassium. Potassium down here with 19 protons is a K, right? So if you see me write K on the board, little K plus, you got to just instantly in your mind be able to translate that into, oh, that's a potassium. We're going to be doing that all the time. So if you don't have that kind of instant intuition, oh, yeah, Na is a sodium, K is a potassium. That's another thing that you're going to want to start really getting comfortable with. You know, some of them are not as, as confusing. You know, calcium is Ca. It's like, at least that one makes sense. Um, so... You know, I should also mention like, you know, when we start, you know, when we get into the digestive system, like three months from now, and we're, we'll talk about minerals in your diet, minerals tend to just be, or are just these elements like phosphorus or magnesium or sodium, you know, when people talk about minerals, you know, as a nutrient, they're just talking about different elements. Um, so... You know, in general, here, if you look in this row here, and does, does this curtain, you can see this little cursor going up and down. Maybe I should, let me see if I can find my thing that lets me draw, annotate. You know, these guys in here, the alkaline metals, these are all things lithium, sodium, potassium, these all have one electron in their valence shell. These usually like to ion, when you put them in water, they lose an electron, therefore they are now plus one because they've lost an electron and they are now plus one. Like you're, I'm never gonna draw Na on the board really. I'm always gonna draw an a plus because as soon as you put the sodium into the water that valence electron is going to um, just take a powder and you'll end up with just a cation Na plus things in I wonder if I can change let me change go back to annotate I can change go to a different color or maybe I'll use red these dudes, these have two electrons in their valence shell. In particular, we're going to see magnesium and calcium. You know, these ionize as well when you put them in, except since they have two valence electrons that leave, what's the charge going to be on them? Plus two. Plus two. So when I draw calcium, I'm never going to write Ca. I'm always going to write Ca, you know, plus plus. Or sometimes people write it as CA2 plus. You know, or magnesium will be also 2 plus or plus plus. That's when it's in water? Yeah, when it's in water. Because when we most, almost everything we're going to look at in this class is happening in an aqueous solution. So the calcium ions or magnesium ions are always going to be 2 plus. Um, sodium ions, potassium ions are always going to be, you know, just one plus cations. So in water, they lose both their electrons, right? And then become Correct. positive. Okay. Correct. Yeah, if you're in the second column here. And then over here, the halogens, you know, in particular, we're going to be seeing chlorine. These have seven electrons in their valence shell. 
So these are the ones that desperately want just one more electron to have a filled valence shell. So on the, whereas things in this first row have that one loosely held electron that they're more likely to just give up, this chlorine is much more likely to grab an electron from wherever in order to fill its outer shell. And that's why we get sodium chloride. Sodium has this one electron in its valence shell that it's just barely holding on to that it easily ionizes. Chlorine, on the other hand, is the opposite. It has one extra cubby hole just waiting for an electron to snag it. So, you know, that's how we get table salt, potassium chloride. We're gonna see calcium chloride in our lab today as well. Um, so just kind of putting that out there. So things that are, if you see things that have things from column one and from this column here, they're pretty likely gonna be making ionic bonds. You know, because you do have to think about, when we talk about osmolarity, you have to think about, does this thing make ionic bonds? Does it dissociate when you put it into water? And so if you're trying to think, does it, is it an ionically bonded thing? If it's made out of sodium or potassium and chlorine, it's probably ionic bonds. Whereas if it's made up of like carbons and oxygens and hydrogens, it's probably covalent bonds. In which case it's not going to dissociate. But if it's made up of things from these two far ends of the table, it's probably make, it's likely making ionic bonds. I have a quick question. Is an ionic compound considered a molecule? Yes. You know, officially, yeah, it's a molecule, but it isn't really a molecule in the way that a water or a sugar is a molecule because it's more of that crystal lattice that forms. Yeah. So I think for the ease of conversation, we say NACL, talking like it's a real thing, but it doesn't really ever exist in the wild as just an NA and a CL sitting side by side making a uh, an individual thing. So, so it is a molecule. It's a com It's a compound, and whether or not you'd call it an individual molecule, it doesn't really form individual molecules in the wild. Um, you know, and we will, we'll, we'll talk about other stuff. I should mention in our class, there are a few main molecule or atoms that make up almost everything. Carbon. You know, carbon, carbon is going to be at the core of lots of, in fact, when we talk about organic compounds, we just mean carbon containing. So anything that has carbon in it, we say is an organic molecule. And most of the things we're going to talk about are organic molecules in this class. Um, again, other things that we're going to see a lot, we'll see a lot of hydrogen. Well, we're going to see a lot of oxygen. Um, other things we're going to see, we'll see a lot of nitrogen. Um, My mouse, I lost, I lost my mouse. Where's my mouse? A lot of nitrogen. Um, we'll see a lot of phosphorus. Um, sulfur shows up quite a bit. We're actually gonna see disulfide bonds, things that stabilize the shape of proteins. You know, so those are some of like, when you think about what are the main atoms elements that make up your body and everything. Those are the main ones. People, in fact, there's like that, what do they call it? Chomps. You know, it's kind of how I still remember it. It's like little, little like mnemonics in my head. Um, you know, obviously there are other things that are important like calcium, you know, to make your bones and things like, you know, other things that are gonna be critical. So it's not like these are the only ones, but those are gonna be some of the main elements we're going to be seeing. Um, so let me get back now. I'm going to stop sharing this. And
kind of going back, we had our protons and our neutrons in the nucleus. We had our little electrons floating around the outside. And so again, I just mentioned this idea if I have 11 protons, no matter what else, it's going to be a sodium. We also mentioned because it's in that alkali metal column, it has that ion, I mean that electron on the outer shell that tends to ionize, tends to get let go. So when we see our sodium, <clears throat> it's usually going to have that el outer electron that's left. So there's only 10 electrons in the valence shell. So if I have 11 pluses and only 10 minuses, most of my NAs are gonna be Na plus. Same thing with potassium. Most of the time we see potassium is gonna be you know, K plus. Magnesium and calcium, which ionize to the plus two, I'm gonna end up having Mg plus plus or calcium plus plus. So again, the I, cations, just as another word for a positive ion. And an ion is just a charged atom, right? It's an atom, but it's an atom with a excess or deficit of electrons in order to make it positive or negative. You know, what type of atom, what type of element it is, is always going to be about the number of protons. So as long as there's 11 protons, it's always a sodium. You know, and the charge on the sodium is going to depend on how many electrons are there. You know, on the other side, we have chlorine I was talking about. You know, chlorine had 17, elect 17 protons. But it usually likes to get an extra electron. So now it has 18 electrons. So if I have 18 electrons on the outside and only 17 protons, this is going to be a Cl minus. We call an anion or a negative ion. Um, ions are going to be super important during the course of our semester. These are the main charge carriers for all the electricity that happens in the body. Um, again, electricity, electric current is just flow of charge. You know, the electric current in the circuitry in your house and in your computer are flowing electrons. Um, in the body, instead of flowing electrons, you're going to have flowing ions, flowing Na pluses and Cl minuses and things like that. Um, we're going to spend a lot of time looking at the behavior and the movement of these ions in the body as we describe the electrical signaling in your neurons and the excitability of muscle tissue and things like that. So it's really important to have this basic idea of an ion, you know, with cations and anions. Um, and again, in our lab today, we're going to see the idea that if you have ions floating around in the solution, you know, you can have an electric current flow through the solution. We're going to see that with our little buzzer, we'll stick the wires in. And if there is enough ions floating around, then they can carry the electric current and complete the circuit. Um, so ions. Are there any questions up to this point? This is this is kind of really base stuff, but I definitely have had semesters where I start and realize like, yes, people have passed chemistry, but they still don't actually quite understand what an ion is. And it really is essential to understand an ion at the beginning because they're going to be playing starring roles through the next four months. Is current the flow of ions then in the body? Yes. Okay. So in general, it's just a flow of charge more generically. 
like coulombs per second. But you know, in the body, that charge is carried by ions. Um, all right. Other things we can talk about. What else? We find neutrons in the in the nucleus as well. You know, for the most part, we're not going to care that much about neutrons, but we should just mention them for a moment. Um, what do we call a atom? You know, I can have, you know. A, you know, I can have a sodium. You know, sodium is always going to have 11 protons. But sometimes it's going to have um, 11 neutrons. Sometimes it'll have 12 neutrons. What do I call a sodium that has, you know, different numbers of neutrons, even though it has the same number of protons? Isotopes. Isotopes. Those are called isotopes. So different isotopes just means different numbers of neutrons in the nucleus. You know, and the number of neutrons is actually important for the nucleus to be stable, to not like break apart. Um, if you don't have the correct number of neutrons in the nucleus, this thing will spontaneously break apart. And that's, you know, it's, because it's radioactive. So there are radioactive isotopes of different elements. If you have this certain number of neutrons, you know, that is clinically relevant to think about radioactive isotopes. Um, radioactive isotopes are used in imaging. Um, radioactive isotopes, you know, radioactive iodine you use to like kill off parts of your overactive thyroid gland even. So in clinical terms, you know, radioactive isotopes actually do come up and it's important to understand there are atoms that are not stable and break apart and release radiation as they break apart. But for our class, you should know the definition of an isotope, but we're not really going to go much deeper than that. Um, the other reason why it's useful to think about isotopes is just so the atomic weights don't sound so confusing. Um, Again, let me, you know, like Na, if we look at sodium, you know, you know, is, what is it? Let me go look at my book here. 23. Um, it says, yeah, so that says, so it says 23, and that 23 is basically grams per mole. Um, let's look at chlorine. These are really rounded off pretty much. Yeah, your, your book rounds them off. If you go into a real one, um, it's going to be very different. Or not, it won't be very, but it'll have more, more, more digits of more precision. 35.5 grams per mole. Um, it's important to pay attention to understand this. If, again, if you've taken chemistry and you've done all your basic kind of conversion and stoichiometry, but just reviewing. So this kind of makes sense. A, an electron doesn't really weigh anything. Um, so this is going to have, we know it has 11 protons because it has to be, to be a sodium which means that it's got to have, in general, 12 neutrons. And that's why it weighs 23 um, grams per mole here. Um, chlorine, chlorine, how can we have a fractional atomic weight? It's the average of all the isotopes. It's the average of all the isotopes, exactly. So chlorine, there's 17 protons. So some of some of them are going to have 18 neutrons. You know, a bunch are going to have 19 neutrons. And this is on average. If you just take a sample of wild chlorine, 
about half of them are going to have 18 neutrons and weigh 35. About half of them are going to have 19 neutrons and weigh 36. So on average, it's going to weigh 35 and a half grams per mole. Right, so understanding isotopes is important also so you don't get confused on how can you have this fractional atomic weight. Um, and then obviously the atomic weight for a compound for sodium chloride together would be, you just add these, would be 58 and a half grams per mole. And a mole, we should, let me mention mole real quick because that's another thing I find people get confused about. Mole. So in chemistry, and I should say in chemistry, obviously there are moles that are digging up your lawn and stuff, or there are moles that are stealing your state secrets working for the enemy. Or So what is a mole in chemistry? It's 0.22, 10 to the 23 grams per mole. So say that one more time, Jamba. Uh, 6.22, 10 to the 23 equals mole, one mole. So times 10 to the 23, what? Of, uh, I'm not sure about the unit. The atoms. 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 Number of atoms. So this number, this is Avogadro's number, um, but a mole is not just a pure number. It's, it's, a num it's the number of atoms or molecules that you're talking about. If I'm talking about a mole of sodium chloride, it's this many sodium chlorides. If I'm talking about a mole of glucose, it's this many glucose molecules. If I'm talking about a mole of hydrogen, it's this many hydrogens. So, you know, people often talk about it like, you know, a dozen if you're talking about buying eggs. Like, what is a practical number of eggs? You go into the store and you buy a carton. A dozen of eggs is a nice number of eggs to put into your shopping basket and put in your fridge. Um, this is, in general, about a handful. Like a, hand, a mole of salt is a little pile in your hand. A mole of sugar is a little pile in your hand. This is kind of a practical amount of stuff. Um, there are different ways to define moles as well. Um, I think this is the most intuitive way for me. It's this many atoms or molecules. If you read other chemistry textbooks, sometimes it will say the same number of atoms or molecules as is found in 12 grams of carbon, right? So carbon has an atomic weight of 12 grams per mole. So 12 grams of carbon is a mole of carbon, this many carbon molecules, car carbon atoms. Um, so sometimes you'll read in a book, you know, the definition of a mole is in the number relation relating to 12 grams of carbon. But again, I think this is the most intuitive way to think about it. You know, this number is a, a physical number, huge, huge, again, 10 to the 23rd, that's Six, oh, two, two, oh, oh, hold on, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three. Yeah, that's right. Um, it's like this many. That's a heck of a lot of atoms or molecules. It's huge. Um, but atoms and molecules are dinkazoid, right? A typical atom is around like one angstrom, which is 10 to the minus 10th meters in diameter. You know, they are really, really, really small. So, you need a lot of atoms to make a little pile of stuff in your hand. 
Um, there are questions about what is a mole? I mean, because we're going to define all our concentrations in molarity, moles per liter. Um, we're going to be talking that so moles, it's important to understand a mole. Any questions about moles? Okay, cool. Um, let's continue. So again, just really super briefly bonds. We had ionic bonds. Oops. That was where we saw like sodium chloride. One atom completely gives up an electron. Another atom completely takes up an electron. This was like sodium. Basically, sodium became Na plus. Cl became Cl minus. And then these are together. And again, we saw it's not just together. They're in these big crystal lattices where they start all connecting in this big crystal lattice. Um, things that are connected this way are often called electrolytes. Because when you put them in water, they break apart into ions and they conduct electricity. So these are also like salts. So they're electrolytes, they're salts. Um, yeah, we talked about covalent bonds. Covalent bonds, this was more the sharing of electrons rather than having a complete give up an electron or completely grab your own electron. You know, we saw water, you could have methane. And covalent bonds have two basic types where either all the electrons are shared symmetrically, no matter what direction you look at this thing, the charge looks kind of similar. So would be like we call non-polar. Or you can have where one part has more electrons, the other side is less electrons. So one part is more negative, one part's more positive. We call this a polar covalent bond. So covalently bonded things might dissolve in water if they're polar covalent bonds, might not dissolve in water if they're nonpolar covalent bonds. So if it's got covalent bonds and I ask, does it dissolve in water, you need more information. Depends whether it's polar or nonpolar molecule. Um, these guys, are pretty strong. You put this in water, the bonds don't break apart. This is sugar as well, right? Sugars, C6, H12, O6. Sugar is, this is polar covalent. You put a sugar molecule in water, it does not break apart. It stays as an intact sugar. That's going to be important for today's lab and for our calculations of osmolarity. Um, and then again, we talked about the very beginning, the idea of hydrogen bonding, like what keeps one polar molecule actually attracted to another polar molecule, that is hydrogen bonding. Those are those kind of weaker electrostatic attractions between separate molecules or different parts of some large molecule. So, covalent, all right. We can do our little rogues gallery of kind of reaction types of reactions. Just to kind of talk about, you know, we're going to see a whole bunch of different chemical reactions. You know, sometimes we are putting things together. We take an A plus a B and it becomes an AB. And what do we call that kind of a reaction? A combination reaction. Come on, what do we call that? Additive? A combination reaction. Am I not hearing it? Maybe, are people talking? I can't hear. Is 
So it can be combination, it can be, or synthesis, also called anabolism, anabolic. Um, we often are breaking things apart. A, B becomes A plus B. Decomposition. Oh, somebody. Oxidation. Oh, there's Marie. I just unmuted. Uh, oxidation. Oh, so it, I think it is my system. I can't. Oh, so, say it again. Oxidation. Uh, oxidation. Oh, Dag Nabbit, I can't hear you guys for some reason. I'm going to have to figure out why my system is, I'm not hearing you. All right. So thank you for, thank you for volunteering to talk. I'm sorry. I can't hear you. Oh man. Okay. So this would be like decomposition or catabolic as we see from Morgan Rooks. Um, other things, you can also have these, um, whoops, exchange or displacement reactions like A, B plus C is going to become A, C plus B. You know, we'll, um, we'll see a lot of things like this as well. I, yeah, I wish I, now I'm bummed I can't hear anybody. Let me check my sound. Oh, well. Um, the, for instance, one of the things we're going to be seeing in fact, let me, I'll do one more and then I'll show you an, I'll show, I'll show you an example of this right now. For instance, in your muscles, in your muscles, probably most people have heard of creatine phosphate. You know, creatine phosphate, which helps get your ATP back up really quick when you're sprinting around. Basically, if you have ADP plus phosphate, so this is what you would have um, if you have broken apart. Remember, ATP goes to ADP plus phosphate. This would be like a decomposition. And then let's say you want to get that ATP back in action right away. One of the ways you can do is use creatine phosphate, which has the creatine with the phosphate, and add this to the ADP. And what happens is this will exchange, this will move that phosphate group over there and you'll end up with creatine just on its own and this recreated ATP. This would be an example of this displacement. We took that phosphate group, which was, um, wait, wait, oh, I just wrote this backwards, didn't I? A, B, oh yeah, so this is like the phosphate. So basically we had creatine phosphate and then we move the phosphate from the creatine onto this. And now we have ATP. This is an example of a displacement or exchange reaction. That's gonna happen you know, commonly. This idea of phosphorylating things, of taking a phosphate group and moving it over from one thing to another, that's gonna happen all the time. It's a big part of cell signaling or in actually long-term kind of turning things on and off is gonna be phosphorylating things taking a phosphate group and taking it from one thing and putting it on another. A lot of times we'll use actually ATP and we'll phosphorylate things by taking the phosphate from the ATP and slapping it on something. So that's going to be important. Um, finally, there's kind of the redox reactions, oxidation reduction. Um, and let's see the time. Oh, it's nine. Yeah, we're doing okay. 
So if somebody could type it into the chat, since I can't hear you, what does it mean to oxidize or reduce? What are we actually tracking? Electrons. So Emily, I can't actually hear you. It, exactly. So there we got gain or loss of electrons. Uh, excellent. So oxidation and reduction. And it's a little not intuitive. Reduction is actually gaining electrons. Um, the way I remember it is you are reducing the overall charge. By adding electrons, you're making things more negative. So, oh yeah, so Emily's got like the little oil rig mnemonic there. Um, so, so oxidation, you are losing electrons and reduction, you're gaining electrons. So, and in our class, most of the reactions that are important for extracting energy are going to involve oxidation and reduction. We're going to have, again, I talked about NADH with its really high energy electrons. And then we're going to, it's going to give up those electrons to something else. And as the electrons are transferred, we're going to release energy and use something useful with it. So a lot of the things we're going to see are going to be moving electrons from one molecule to another, and often from one to another, to another, to another. So redox. Um, the sum total of all the chemical reactions in the body, we call metabolism. When we say metabolism, we're talking about like all of this all at once. Um, and most of the reactions in your body do not happen in this kind of simple, you know, we've been talking, oh, you have your reactants, you know, and going to products. So a couple of things I should mention before we actually go into the idea of pathways. Most of the reactions, even though you often think about them being drawn with reactants with an arrow going to the products, it's more important to think about the idea of a chemical equilibrium. Chemical equilibrium means that it's a two-way street, right? If you have a preponderance of reactants here, the reaction will tend to move this direction. But if you change conditions, it might be these products start combining to become back into the reactants again. And this reaction is going to go left or right depending on conditions. And wherever the conditions are, it will find some equilibrium where the rate of reactants turning into products is balanced by the products turning back into reactants. And there's some resting equilibrium concentration that they end up at. And if you upset that equilibrium, it will find some new balance. It's kind of like what we saw with the buffer systems in the lab on Thursday. You know, you add or subtract protons and then all of a sudden the, um, the weak acids and bases of the buffer are going to start reconfiguring and finding some new balance, some new a new um, place to find their concentration. So in general, sometimes things really are one way. Like if the, if the reactants are some gas that bubbles out of the atmosphere, then you're not really going to get them back to move back in the other direction. But most of the time, our chemical reactions are going to be some, some mix of both of products going into reactants, reactants turning into products, and finding some equilibrium based on whatever the current conditions are. Um, let's talk about things that affect rates of reactions.
And I'm, I am still dying to hear you guys. It's kind of, so I, um, do you hear us now, Doctor? No. Okay, so hold on. So can you, I heard you. Did somebody talk? Yes, me. Uh, I can hear you Perfect. now. The reaction rate. I'm so happy. So what kind of things affect how fast a reaction goes? This is going to be a Another critical thing to think about in our concentration. So if there's a catalyst present. Concentration is going to be a big thing. Concentration. Enzymes. So let's let's start. Let me start with this. And enzymes are also going to be important, and we will get to those. In a moment. So again, we have our reactants. Awesome. Products. And if you think about what chemical reactions are, it's things zipping around and bashing into each other and stuff. And the more concentrated, the more likely you're going to have things bash into each other and something happen. So concentration, if concentration goes up, it's more likely the reaction is going to be going. Um, what other things are going to increase reaction rate? And then would temperature, because the molecules are moving faster. Yeah, temperature. The higher the temperature, the more energy they have to like slam into each other or break apart. So temperature is going to affect reaction rate pretty dramatically. Um, and then I heard one other, what was the other thing that somebody just said? Buffer? pH. Okay. So the enzymes. So buffers wouldn't so much affect reaction rate. Buffer is going to stabilize pH, um, and we'll see indirectly will help with the reaction rate so your enzymes don't die. But enzymes are the things that we really want to talk about. You know, if you were in some industrial chemical process where you're just trying to make some chemical, you actually have these reaction vessels where you just have high concentrations at really high temperatures to speed things up. You know, in our bodies, obviously, we have to keep things at a lower temperature. We can't like bring your body temperature up to, you know, 10,000 degrees to speed up this reaction or something. So instead, we have enzymes to speed things up, and we need to talk a bunch about enzymes. Enzymes, which are basically organic catalysts. So what is a catalyst? What are the defining qualities of a catalyst? The substance that increases the rate of like a chemical reaction. So it increases the rate of the reaction. And so it basically, or you, if you get into the more kind of pedantic, it lowers the activation energy, makes it more likely the reaction is going to go under the current conditions. Um, again, we can just think about it just really increasing the rate of the reaction. And then there's one other critical, critical part of it. It only affects the reactants. Say it again. Um, it only affects reactants. Um, no, it's, it'll, you know, you have, no, it actually goes back, back and forth. Reactants and products, if this is catalyzed by an enzyme, this will go either way use with the same enzyme, um, depending on other things like concentration of products versus reactants. So a, an enzyme can actually allow things to go both directions. But it's specific to one reactant. Yeah, so um, we are going to see enzymes that are specific. 
but something more about catalysts. Catalysts. I want something about catalysts. It doesn't undergo any permanent change. Yeah, it is not consumed. So this is important. It doesn't get used up. It's not an, it's only a temporary part of the reaction. It doesn't actually change into um, something else. When we're all done, it's back on its own. Like the classic, um, um, and we have our, so substrate, you should know the word substrate. Substrate, this is the, um, this is the molecule that enzyme, the enzyme binds. So the substrate, let's say, let's say I have an enzyme that is important for um, starting your di breaking down sugars. I have a, we're going to talk about carbohydrates. I can have sucrose and I have sucrose, which is like a glucose and a fructose. And I want to break it apart into, you know, two simpler sugars. The substrate is just the thing that the enzyme is going to bind to originally. Um, so I have my substrate. And then I'm going to have an enzyme. These are going to go and become what we call my enzyme substrate complex. So there's first, there's just a substrate and there's an enzyme and now there's this ES complex where there's this actual binding between the two. We'll talk more about that binding in a few moments. But then, like in this case, these things break apart and we're going to end up with some products but then we have the enzyme is just ready to go again. So this idea that the enzyme played a temporary role making this enzyme substrate complex, but then after the reaction was done, the enzyme is just ready to go. It did not get consumed. It did not get used up. It did not get changed in any fundamental way. Um, you know, in this case, my substrate might have been sucrose then the enzyme in the sucrose made this enzyme substrate complex, which resulted in the break apart of the sucrose into the simpler sugars, which are now floating around, but the enzyme's ready to go again. Um, in general, enzymes are made out of proteins, which is gonna be important actually, um, with these kind of complicated shapes that can bind the substrate. Um, I want to clear. So here's my enzyme. It's this big protein. I have my substrate coming in. And we have this, so here's my substrate. And we have what's called binding. And this binding, we're going to talk about binding as well when we get to the idea of ligands binding receptors and things. It's a mix of having a physical shape where the two things fit together, as well as having chemical properties where they match up. 
you know, to make hydrogen bonds, for instance. You know, so things that, so this binding, it relies on the physical shape of this is actually important. So the substrate fits on the enzyme appropriately. This is gonna be why making sure the enzyme doesn't lose its shape is so important. Um, so these are enzymes, these are typically proteins. Um, the basic model of how enzymes work is as a substrate goes and kind of fits in there, it gets tweaked in some way where the reaction will happen. So then when we're done, the enzyme is still there. But now our thing is kind of floating off, having, you know, you know, this thing gets in there as it gets into the little binding site there. We call this the active site where the binding happens. Then as the substrate binds into the active site, the magic happens and then Enzyme is now waiting for the next go round, and our products are, are done. Um, when we get to proteins, we're going to talk more specifically about the things that can denature proteins, that can mess up their shape. Anything that messes up the shape of a protein is going to probably mess up your chemical, your metabolism, because all your chemical reactions are run by enzymes. And what, what kind of things can mess with the shape of a, of a protein? pH, temperature. Temperature, pH, things like that. We're gonna talk more about that. So those things, part of keeping your pH homeostasis, temperature homeostasis in their safe zones is just so all of your enzymes keep their right shapes so they can bind with their substrates and do their chemical reactions. Um, so, like if I ask a question on a test, like why is it so important, why does denaturing enzymes make it so a chemical reaction is not going to run in your body? You know, if, if I mess up the shape of the enzyme, what's going to happen? It's not going to bind. Not, yeah, it's not going to be able to bind the substrate and make the reaction, catalyze the reaction. So making sure your enzymes don't denature by keeping the pH and temperature and things like that stable is really important. Um, so it's, it looks like it's time for a break. So we've just been talking about different kinds of reactions. We've been talking about enzymes. And what we're gonna do now is talk about kind of the reality of how chemical reactions tend to happen in the body. And it's usually not kind of a simple thing where you have, oh, here are some reactants going to some products. It's usually a much more complicated thing that we call a metabolic pathway. So I'm gonna kind of introduce this idea, kind of describe how it works, show you some examples um, just so you can kind of get a better sense of how that all looks. So here we go. So we are gonna talk about the idea of a metabolic pathway. Which kind of, it's kind of sounds like you're going along, you have to take step after step to get where you're going, which is basically what it is. Um, for a classic example, in our class, we're gonna be spending a lot of time talking about cellular respiration. Uh, if we wanna write the chemical reaction that describes cellular respiration, kind of the breakdown of sugar to make ATP, it's really simple on the surface. Here's glucose. Plus, what else do we need to add if we're going to 
do get our energy from the glucose? Oxygen. Oxygen. We need six oxygens. O2. And what comes out the other side? Water. We're going to have six waters. And carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide and energy. In which case, it's usually somewhere around like 36 ATP. Um, so it looks on the surface totally straightforward. Take sugar, some oxygen, and you end up with water, carbon dioxide, and ATP. And this is the final accounting. When we look at this in more detail and look at what's going on in the cytosol and in the mitochondrion and everything, this will be the ultimate kind of checklist of like how many sugars and oxygens came in, how many ox waters and carbon dioxides did we end up with, but it's not going to be a straightforward thing. It's going to be many, many, many steps. Again, we're going to take like an entire day just describing how we get from point A to point Z in this thing. So for instance, you know, the very first step here, the first part of this is, which is happens in the cytosol, we're gonna talk about in more detail is cellular rest is um, glycolysis. You know, you're gonna start with glucose and you might think like, okay, glucose and now, ox now oxygen isn't gonna come for so long. You know, the next step, glucose is gonna go and become a phosphorylated glucose. That's the next step, which you know you don't even know what exists from looking at the big overall e equation. But this is one of the characters in this in this actual metabolic pathway. Um, you know, and this does not just happen on its own; it happens because something helps this reaction go, increases the reaction rate, helps make it go from glucose. What what do we call these molecules that help? lower the activation energy and make the reaction run? Enzymes. Enzymes. So each step in our metabolic pathway is going to be associated with an enzyme. And I'm putting it kind of, kind of comes in and it leaves. Remember, they don't get consumed. So it comes in, does its magic, and then it's ready to go someplace else. Um, this phosphorylated glucose is going to go to a next step. And it's, it is actually going to be like 10 steps here. Actually, by the time we get to the ATP, there's going to be way more than 10 steps. Like not, I could call this like step A, step B, step C. Let's just like call this step Z. It's going to be so many different steps before we get to the end. And at each step, there's going to be some enzyme that takes you from one to the next. Each of these molecules that you make along the way that is not a final product, we call an intermediate. So the things that are not, you know, remember here we had our reactants, we had our products. But then there's a whole bunch of molecules as B, C, D, E, that are not things that we are actually going to use in the end, but get made along the way of this pathway. Those are called intermediates. And then you have an enzyme that takes you from one intermediate to the next intermediate. So this is this basic idea of a pathway. You know, in the end, by you know, A, you know, if, if in this thing I'm saying, A would be a reactants, Z is your products. But to go from A to Z, you're actually taking many of these little sub steps along the way, making intermediates and using enzymes to get from one intermediate to the next. Um, for instance, in this case, the enzyme that is going to convert glucose to phosphorylated glucose is called hexokinase. 
Um, enzymes often have the suffix ase, ace. If you see something ace, it's usually an enzyme. Hexo just means hexo, hexo, hexo sugar or six carbon sugar. And kinase means something that phosphorylates things. Um, kinases, enzymes that catalyze phosphorylation. A kinase in general takes a phosphate group from something and does this exchange or displacement reaction, puts it on something else. You know, in this case, this kinase is taking a ATP and moving the phosphate group from the ATP onto the glucose. So now we have glucose with a phosphate group on it. Um, it's worth knowing this word kinase. We're going to see lots of important kinases along the way. Again, the very first step of glycolysis, of extracting energy from sugar, involves a kinase. Um, when we look at signal transduction, the way that um, a receptor ultimately um, creates activity in the cell is usually by turning on some protein kinase that phosphorylates proteins within the cell. Um, I mentioned just a little earlier today, creatine kinase that will move phosphate groups from a creatine to back onto an ATP to um, re-up the ATP again. So we're going to see kinases again and again and again in many different contexts. Um, and again, when you see that word kinase, it means that it's an enzyme that's catalyzing the phosphorylation of things. The, slapping a phosphate group onto something. Um, so and again, we'll, we'll come back to this in more detail, the actual glycolysis when we do glycolysis in a, like another week or so. But for right now, I'm just kind of putting this in here more as this example of what the heck is a metabolic pathway. So this metabolic pathway, I start with the sugar and I end up with the ATP, but there's many steps. Um, so let's talk about some of the benefits of doing it this way, because obviously it's a big, complicated thing. Um, I'm going to redraw this a little less messy. I'm just going to say to B, to C, dot, 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 to Z which is our ATP. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, so X, yeah, so this is this idea of a metabolic pathway. Again, an enzyme to catalyze each step. Typically the enzymes, somebody mentioned earlier, typically the enzymes are very special, specific to a particular substrate. Whatever molecule the enzyme actually binds with is you know, the substrate for that enzyme. Um, so the nice thing about this system is you can control it. And like for instance, with glucose, let's say you are putting more and more glucose in your body, but you got enough ATP. What, what do you, what can you do? Store it. You can store it as fat. People are probably aware of this, you know? So if you, the first steps are going to be the same though. You know, we're going the first, in fact, the first 10 steps or so are going to be exactly the same, whether or not you're breaking down the glucose, to make ATP, or if you're going to make fat, there's going to be an off ramp. So instead of going, you know, instead of going to D, we're going to go to D prime and to E prime and dot, 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 and we're going to end up with fat. 
So this can we can have an off ramp, or we might have another off ramp, maybe go off to D double prime, to E double prime, and maybe we'll make cholesterol, which we need for our cell membranes and to make our um, steroid hormones or something. So you can have these pathways where they start out and have the same initial steps but then you have off ramps and go off and have different outcomes. Um, another way, like more than things, more than glucose is broken down for ATP, right? You can, you can eat fat and you can get ATP. You get energy if you're eating a stick of butter or something. So you can have, let's say here's, you know, fats. And the first steps of fat breakdown are going to be some other, I don't know, I'll do quadruple prime, da, 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 da. But eventually, it will, the last steps are going to be the same to finally make ATP. So you can have like on ramps onto this. You can have little off ramps. So this gives you this incredible flexibility. Um, you know, so glucose to ATP, that could go just straight, or you could start with glucose, but then take an off ramp and end up storing that energy as fat, or you could use make cholesterol. You can also have other things to start with here. You can actually start with proteins and break those down, and those will have other on ramps that ultimately will have the same final steps. So does, is, this, is this making sense? Um, you know, in our class, we will be looking at a few specific metabolic pathways in more detail. But if you were taking like molecular biology, this is all you'd be doing is looking at metabolic pathways for like four months and learning what are the different pathways, what are the intermediates, what are the enzymes and stuff. Um, I, I'll share a... Here, let me share this. Um, back. That was not what I meant to do. Let's go here. Do -do -do. Share screen. Um, so this is... Um, Oh, shoot. Okay, so hold on. Am I, I'm having issues today here. So here we have this. Can you all see this? Yes. So on this picture here, to give you a sense of what you're looking at, I need to go get my annotator tool. I'm going to draw, like on this picture here, here's glucose. Here's phosphorylated glucose. This is glucose. Here's his first intermediate, phosphorylated glucose, which is then going to this fructose, uh, going to this glyceraldehyde. Um, we're going to do, 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 ends up at pyruvate. Um, Going down, this is actually all this stuff that's happening in, um, in the mitochondria, the Krebs cycle, continuing down. These are all steps on the way to make ATP. Um, here you can see a off-ramp making fatty acids. Um, you can also see on-ramps, things coming in from breaking up. So all this stuff here, you know, here is like if you started with sucrose, which is like normally what you'd eat, and it has to come in, it gets broken down into glucose and fructose, which then get kind of fed in. So you have on ramps, you have off ramps, you have this main path of glycolysis, and all this other stuff here. Each of these little molecules is an intermediate of some other important pathway in your cell. And everything, everything that connects one intermediate to the next intermediate is a one-step enzyme-catalyzed reaction that is a step in a pathway. 
So fortunately for you, you are not going to have to think about most of this. But it is important to realize this idea of metabolic pathways, this idea of intermediates, um, and the idea of enzymes taking you from one step to the next step. And again, we will look at a few of these in more detail as we go on through the semester. You know, particularly the breakdown of glucose to make ATP, we'll look at in a lot of detail. Um, we'll look at some of the pathways involved with cell signaling in quite a bit of detail. Um, but just kind of putting that out there. Um, all right, let me stop sharing.